Guten Tag, meine Freunde, und willkommen to the week that was when we were so much older then, in our first visit to one of my favorite musical years, the week ending February 7th, 1975. Underpinning this entire ludicrous and unlikely endeavour is Elton John with his rather flat cover of Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds. Elton was a world bestriding Goliath at the time, a veritable and literal Hercules to the charts, and his music was characterised by its infectious energy, something which just seemed missing from this piece. Nonetheless, this was bound for a peak of number four and a jolly good run on the charts early disco rumblings with the three degrees as When Will I See You Again, a blockbuster for Kenny Gamble and Leon Huff and their Philly sound. The twosome three coo longingly over a gentle funk groove with just enough old school soul to be looking Janus faced at a moment in musical history. Eight is the often discussed in these pages William Shakespeare, or John Cave as his mummy used to call him, with the second and weaker of his two hits, My Little Angel, starting its drop down the charts. Plucked from obscurity on the Albert label, Shakespeare was utterly unprepared for the stresses of even mid-level local celebrity, both physically, he was twice the age of most of his audience, not possessed of either teen idol looks or a strong voice, and had a stage presence more akin to that of a club entertainer which once he had been. Nor mentally, he struggled with depression and alcoholism and he was never likely to have a long career. What killed it was a scandal around his having sex with an allegedly underage president of his fan club. The fact that she was not underage and was a plant by a Melbourne newspaper to stir up some scandal went unreported. Cage was convicted and sentenced to the notorious Chelmsford Private Hospital as a sex offender under the care of a sadistic maniac named Harry Bailey. After many years of homelessness, addiction and humiliation, Death finally came to him as a welcome friend in 2010. Another sad loss was Harry Chapin, who was a fine singer-songwriter and an old-school committed lefty who actually, you know, did things other than loot shoe stores and screech at people about not wearing masks. Harry is represented here by probably his most famous song, Cats in the Cradle, a song that no matter how crammed it is with artificial sentimentality, will still tug at the hearts of any middle-aged man watching his own sons go through the vicissitudes of life. I wonder who that might be. Get out your cigarette lighters. No, you buffoon, the light on your iPhone is not an adequate substitute. And get ready to headbang until you accidentally set your hair on fire with the lighter. It's a band with one of the best band names of the 70s, Backham and Turner Overdrive, with their not quite mega hit, You Ain't Seen Nothing Yet, although it did make number one in the United States, but it wasn't a mega hit here, so it doesn't count. BTO were, in their way, a sort of a Canadian credence, in as much as there was a general sameness to all of their songs, which the critics would complain about, but when they changed, the critics complained they didn't sound like themselves anymore. In the late 70s, that's a trap they fell into, progressing first to increasingly irrelevant has-been status, playing more pathetic and unlikely venues with each tour before re-emerging as national treasures and guardians of the memories of millions of middle-aged men as yet untouched by Harry Chapin's maudlin Velta showing. It's a well-established truth here, on the past as a foreign country, that our facts don't care about your feelings. Especially the fantastic facts in Fowl's fantastic world of facts. The biggest upthruster of the week is Doug Parkinson's version of the old chestnut everlasting love, bounding up 11 spots from 34 to 23, while the biggest faller was my favorite Bee Gees record, Mr. Natural, down five to 34. The longest lasting record on the charts this week was Hey Paula by Ernie Sigley and Denise Drysdale. 20 weeks in, its second appearance in these pages, and it was still rubbish. The only, and therefore highest debutant this week, was that vision of pulchritude and luminosity. Olivia Newton-John at number 40 with If You Love Me, Let Me Know. The number one hit from the coast of California to the shores of the Delaware Bay was Laughter in the Rain by Neil Sedaka. A chap like Gene Pitney or Roy Orbison who never really stopped having hits in Australia, even when their star dimmed abroad. 
in the UK. It was soon to be number one over here. It was January by Pilot, a band from Edinburgh, two of whom were briefly Bay City Rollers before Pilot was a thing, and three of whom left Pilot along with their arranger engineer when they were pinched to play in Kate Bush's band and appeared on her first two albums, The Good One and The Rubbish One. January spent three weeks on top of the local charts and eight weeks on top of the Australian charts, one of the longest running ever number ones from May to July. Number one album around town was Elton John's Greatest Hits, which was 10 dead obvious songs for the guy who really filled his album with deep cuts. That is the one virtue of the Spotify era. You can make a Greatest Hits that includes both the obvious singles and the deep cuts, and you aren't limited by time, only by the expectations of Spotify or its sponsors. Now, where were we? 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, ah yes, 5. 5 is the Sweets version of Peppermint Twist, a number one hit from mid-January. Not a song the cool kids at the time, or frankly any time for that matter, would rate highly, but in truth it's a fantastic little record. It's all about what Top 40 Radio should be, 100% positive vibe. And the same can be said for number four, Please Mr. Postman, by, get this, the biggest selling American act of the 1970s. Not the Eagles, not Fleetwood Mac or Chicago, but the criminally underrated Carpenters. Comprised of two unique and complementary talents, Karen with her deep voice limited in range but impossibly deep with emotion and subtlety, and Richard, one of the most undervalued record makers of his era who knew not only how to frame Karen's voice perfectly, but also how to get the LA pros who made the records to make the records the way he wanted them to. And Please Mr. Postman is a perfect example. There's ostensibly the sunny, up-tempo A-side with an incredibly tight bass line, which keeps it hustling along relentlessly, almost like one of those Krautrock Motoric songs. There are no transitional points between each phase of the song. It's thing ends, next thing begins. There's no, there's no point where it swings between the two. And the B-side, This Masquerade, which shows them off to perfection. Karen's voice pitted darkly full of ache against a muted jazzy background. Can I also add that the album This Masquerade is from, Now and Then, has a really cool cover. Number three, Billy Swan is the definition of a one-hit wonder, with his I Can Help spending a week atop the charts before succumbing to the current number one, and Billy Swan never being heard of again. The real version of this that should have been a hit is Elvis Presley's gospel version from his rather terrific Today album. Like most Elvis 70s material, it needs a remix, but Ole clearly likes the song and he gives it all he's got, which in 1975 is still more than most folks had, especially Billy Swan. At number two is the magnificent Susie Quattro. The glorious Susie Quattro with the stomping wild one from her chart-topping Quattro album. Susie is a regular tourist to Australia and sells out the two and a half to five thousand seat venues every time. But I've never actually seen her. The last four times she's been here I've either missed her through either being in hospital or once because a massive thunderstorm basically destroyed the outdoor venue before she came on. But nothing will sway my devotion to Susie, especially when she has glam rock skull crushes like this one on my playlist. Even Monty the Safety Monkey thinks Susie is an impossible act at top, but he is wrong, so wrong. Drum us into the number one, Monty. At number one, it is legendary Aussie act Skyhooks whose Living in the 70s album pretty much redefined the Australian music scene and our popular cultural scene, with songs frankly dealing with sex, drugs and suburban malaise, but did so in broad Australian accents and dropping Australian place names. Horror Movie was far from the best song on the album, or the best single, but had to be chosen because most of the rest of the album was banned from radio play, most notably the excellent You Just Like Me Because I'm Good In Bed, but doubtless helped by their outrageous performances on the new Countdown program, it spent four weeks at number one before 
finally being done for by Please Mr. Postman. It eventually wandered off the charts in June after a six month run. And that was pretty much it, truth be told, for Skyhawks. Their next album, Ego Is Not A Dirty Word, was fair and made number one, probably based on expectations raised by living in the 70s. 1976's Straight In A Gay Gay World was uneven, and after that it was the sound of lineup changes and an increasingly disinterested band. But in 1974-75, these guys were laying out the road work for the Australian rock boom of the late 70s and the Aussie invasion of the US charts from 1983 on, and Horror Movie is the most indelible artefact of that output. And that's how the cow ate the cabbage kids for the week ending February 7th, 1975. And let me tell you, 1975 just gets better and better. Abermania and disco lay in the future, in the past, which suddenly doesn't seem so much a foreign country.